what you're looking at here is um, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp, a painting by Rembrandt from 1632. And uh, the two figures, the one to the right and the one to the left, is my colleague uh, Petria Noble and myself varnishing the painting after having uh, removed the old yellow varnish on this painting. And we are moving very quickly with our hands because it's a large surface to varnish and we wanted to varnish without the varnish sticking and drying, so it had to go very quickly. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about this painting, uh, which is a unique painting in art history, but also unique out of a scientific point of view, because with this painting, research into something called uh, the understanding of protrusions or metal soaps within paintings uh, were uh, not maybe started, but got a new uh, interest amongst researchers. This paper is therefore probably the most scientific of the papers, if I may say so, the one that refers most to the input of the natural sciences or conservation scientists. Well, first of all, we have a young man, Rembrandt. He's born in 1606 and dies in 1669 as an elderly man. Um, he paints a self-portrait around 1629, uh, just before he moves to Amsterdam from Leiden, where he was born and where he was trained and where he worked for uh, many years. He moves to Amsterdam, and uh, uh, this is what he looks like, this young, uh, ambitious painter. Uh, at the time when he paints this self-portrait, he also painted a small panel uh, with a laughing man, a soldier, uh, on the image here, it's much too big compared to the other ones because it only has this size in reality. And it's painted on copper. On top of the copper uh, is a layer of grey paint, and on top of the grey paint is gold leaf. And on top of the gold, that's where he painted this painting. Can't see the gold, uh, but the glow of it may add in understanding some of the features around his face. And he also painted uh, in 1630, approximately, Andromeda to the bottom right. And the reason I show you this is that Rembrandt started his career uh, by being a history painter. To paint scenes uh, that comes out of your imagination based on literature, on uh, the Bible, Ovidius, uh, metamorphosis, or whatever it may be, and creating new images of what comes up in your mind by reading. Uh, this is being regarded in the 17th century, where we are now, as the ultimate level of which an artist could inspire, uh, aspire. To paint portraits was one of the lower ranks, because any painter who could paint at all could paint a portrait. It's just depicting reality but trying to make an image like Andromeda standing here, uh, is, it, which is new, a new composition, is what really counts. And this is how Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam as a young painter, wanting to uh, become the history painter. When he comes to Amsterdam, uh, he gets, however, numerous commissions on portraits. Portraits is uh, one of the things that he very wonderfully can create, and you can in your exhibition here uh, see uh, some examples that are just wonderful images, both portraits, but of course when you paint a image of a mythological figure, where is the portraiture then? Is that just imagination or is it based on somebody else? Now. This has nothing directly with Rembrandt to do. This is an anatomical theater in uh, Amsterdam where uh, the uh, surgeons would desiccate dead people to find out how they were made, how we are made. Um, in the 16th century and the 15th, beginning of 17th century, uh, the surgeons were looking into the human body uh, with some reservation, because it was, after all, God's creation. And how can you question God's creation? By opening up a dead body, you are questioning what is in here. Uh, 
and there were some possibly some difficulties in doing this at this particular moment but nevertheless within this building here in Amsterdam is where the anatomical theater is placed where doctors were trained and at the top floor in here is where the doctors also had their guild room where they met uh, and assembled and held meetings other rooms within this building would have bricklayers or carpenters having their guild rooms where they were meeting the building is still in Amsterdam it's called the uh, Oude Waag, uh, the old warehouse it was transformed into a warehouse later and now it's a very merry area in, uh, in Amsterdam with a lot of small bars and restaurants around this old building um, Within the building, the guilds had uh, portraits of uh, their members. And here's one of the portraits by Peter Artsen from 1601, which shows the surgeons sitting around, all the professors in anatomy sitting around their master, sitting down here, uh, Dr. Sebastian Eckbert, and he's having a dead corpse and demonstrating to the other people uh, how this human body is put together. Of course, this is not a realistic scene, because they're not sitting like this, like in a classroom, like a photograph from your school, it looks like. But that was how you made group portraits at this particular moment in the Netherlands. Had all the faces lined up like a group portraits, even before cameras were invented. And um, another painting by uh, Picanoi is showing here Another uh, lesson where uh, Dr. Eckbert is sitting here demonstrating, no, he's standing here demonstrating how the skeleton is put together, how the support of the various elements within the skeleton supports all the flesh that's giving the body its, its uh, appearance. And here's a later one from 1724 in a different style, uh, artistic styles have changed uh, and Cornelis Troost's paintings has a much lighter appearance and you also here have this dead body where as the surgeon uh, Willem Röhl is demonstrating how the knee is working. And that's how you train doctors. Now, what has this to do with Rembrandt's? Well, it is in this context we should see his painting uh, which looks like this before we treated it, before we removed the yellow varnish. And what's new about this painting, and what is reflecting Rembrandt's training as a history painter, is that he's not making a school portrait. He's really making a dynamic composition with people standing and bending and looking over, and he's having the corpse in a diagonal out towards us, like Cornelis Trost later did it, inspired by Rembrandt. So it's kind of yeah, you see his training being reflected, although he is a portrait painter. And he is painting the portrait of Nicholas Tulp and a number of these surgeons that were present uh, as his uh, faculty at the time. We have the names on each of them because the names are written on this piece of paper here. And they have each of them a little number next to their faces, so we can see number one is Tulp, number two is so-and-so, and I'm not going to mention all of the names, uh, but uh, we can see who they are. And we can see that Dr. Tulp is now, uh, with his forceps uh, there, lifting some of the tenons, and he's demonstrating with his other hand that when I lift these, the hand will move like this. So he's really demonstrating what is happening here with the, with the, book, with the corpse, how the body works. So he wants really to put also all this into a context. Um, well, the painting is not the only anatomy lesson that Rembrandt made. This is a, a, a copy of a drawing, or a photograph of a drawing, uh, a huge painting, also with a doctor standing here in the middle, and the corpse lying here, and all the doctors around. Unfortunately, this painting does not exist anymore. It was the anatomy lesson of Dr. Daimann, was the name of the, of the person, Dr. Daimann, and only a fragment still exists, this little fragment here. Uh, the rest uh, was lost in a fire. Uh, so only this part is there, and you see what is happening is that this guy is standing with something in his hand, which is the top of the skull that has been cut off here, opened up. And this guy is not having red hair, that's the brain you're looking at. 
with blood on the brain. Uh, and he is demonstrating here, while his servant is holding the skull, uh, how the brain looks and how it works. And with a figure lying with the legs out here, in an extreme foreshortening, uh, which also was uh, an exercise that Rembrandt was very good in, making these foreshortenings. Um, so, later on in his career, he got this opportunity. Now, let's return to the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tjolp, which is in the Maurits house in The Hague in the Netherlands. Uh, you saw me varnishing the painting, and that has a reason, because I was employed at this museum for 15 years. From 1990 to uh, 2004, I was uh, head of conservation at the Maurits house. And uh, the paintings I'm talking about uh, this now and this afternoon will be paintings that I have been involved in restoring myself as well. What we have here is a photograph, uh, or rather the back of a photograph of the anatomy lesson, which was made in uh, 1877, where the conservator Nicholas Hopman, who at that time was taking care of the collection uh, in the Maritz house, he writes a little bit about the damages and he draws on the back of the photograph all the holes and tears that he found in the painting when he was starting his treatment at the end of the uh, 19th century. We should understand that the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tjolp was hanging in the guild room in Amsterdam after Rembrandt finished it, finished it in, 19, uh, in 1632. It was hanging on a wall uh, next to the bricklayer's meeting room and um, it is noted in some of the documents from uh, late in the, uh, in the 17th century that uh, there was a a burning mark in the jacket of Dr. Tulp sitting to the right side of the painting. And that was come because in the gilt room next door, which was the bricklayers, bricklayers, as you can imagine, work outside in all <coughs> types of weather. And in the winter, it becomes very cold. And they go in here, and they put a lot of fire in their fireplace. And it simply had a crack in the wall. So fire and smoke came in on the back side of the painting hanging on this wall. So in the late, um, late 17th century, they had to restore the painting and, as it says in the report, give Dr. Tulp a new jacket. So a new jacket was painted on top of what had been damaged. Um, throughout the 18th century, there are continuous complaints about water dripping down on the painting. From the ceiling, uh, there were some leaks and it's dripping down and those taking care of the house didn't have the energy or the finances to do anything about it, so it continues dripping down. That also caused a lot of damage to the flaking paint uh, and so forth. It was lined at one point with a glue lining. Uh, it was relined with a new glue lining. It was lined again with a wax lining by Mr. Hopman in 1877. The wax lining, that is the current lining, the, the current extra layer of canvas on the back that's holding the painting today. So you can imagine, uh, well, I don't know if you can imagine, but a lining in uh, the 18th and 19th century would involve an iron like you use for ironing your shirts. Uh, but you wouldn't have a thermostat on this iron, so you would simply heat it on a stove standing in your room. You would have a number of irons standing on the stove, put fire into it, and when you could hear it was hot, you would apply it to the paint surface to make the, the glue paste uh, dry out, so that the glue paste lining, I can see one of you looking at me as, what is a glue paste lining? That is flour mixed with water, like you make porridge in the morning maybe, and uh, you would smear that over a new piece of canvas, and while it's still wet, this kind of paste, you would put your old master painting on top of this, and you would start ironing the surface to make it dry out and make this, the glue paste stick, and then you would have a new canvas when it's all dried out. You would have an interleaf of paper or something while you were ironing. When the iron got cold, you would take a new iron and feel if it was hot enough, and you would iron it until it was all stuck and dry. With wax lining, which was an invention uh, of the Dutch, to some degree at least, uh, you would uh, uh, melt wax in a big bowl. Uh, sometimes you would add a little bit of colophony or, or natural resin to the wax to make it harder. And then you would smear that 
melted hot wax out on a new canvas, apply your old master again on top of this, and then you would heat it so much that the wax and uh, material would melt into the painting from behind, and it should ideally come up and touch the surface to adhere the paint layer. So you really would like to continue melting and melting with your hot iron again until the whole old master painting was totally impregnated with wax resin and in that way fixed the paint layer. It's an extremely harsh method. Any of us uh, would, would be horrified by, by doing this uh, the, the old-fashioned way. We have other ways of doing it today. We don't do it with wax nor with glue paste today, I believe. Um, but th this has happened three or four times with this painting. It has been restored about uh, 12 times uh, during the past 300 years. So it is really a painting that has been through a lot of treatments. Uh, the treatment with the wax resin involved also applying Copaifa balsam, which is an etherical balsam, to the lining material as well as to the varnish on the surface that was put on after treatment. Copaifa balsam was uh, sought to regenerate uh, and revitalize a painting. It's all the etherical oils that would be introduced in the painting would, would kind of melt, the, especially the varnish layer together, so crackers in the varnish layer that would scatter the light falling on the surface and make it less able to be interpreted, would flow together again. A very, very idealistic way of trying to regenerate parts of paintings especially the varnish layers, in order to avoid to use solvents to remove the varnish and apply a new one. So the, the, the idea behind the, the method is, is fantastic and very good, believed to be a very good method for many years around the change of a century. Uh, but we know now that this has a disastrous effect on some of the paintings, because it also softens the uh, original oil paint by the artists which then, during a lining process, can be completely flattened out, so the pastosity and the surface character of the paintings are eliminated. However, this was not seen as a problem at that particular time here, because as conservation is also, as we talked about earlier this morning, uh, a result of changes in attitude, changes in fashion, uh, at this particular moment in time, French art was very popular in Europe, and French art at that time was exactly very flat. You shouldn't be able to see brush strokes. So conservators, know, knowingly or not, adapted also treatments that didn't take care of the surface texture and therefore eliminated to some degree these, uh, which was not seen as a problem by the art historians or directors of the museums at the time. Here you have a detail of one of the uh, people standing in front of uh, Dr. Tull, and there's an area here where, where the hot iron has also been slightly melting the uh, surface of the, the paint layer, and it's been bubbling up and uh, making a surface texture that is alien to what Rembrandt applied. You have here some fillings. Uh, there were some uh, losses somewhere in the painting, and they were filled in with, with glue and chalk, and they were then s lowered down, and in this case, with scraped down with sandpaper or hot materials, and covering larger areas of the original paint as well. Not to say that they were bad restorers, they were doing it what, the way that uh, was thought to be well done at the time. Another detail of the surface before our recent treatment in uh, 1998, where you see that the varnish is, is kind of separating from the, the paint layer below along the crackers in the paint because something oozes out or something's made the varnish in, in areas simply slip away from the paint layer uh, due to maybe all the treatments that have been introduced. And we thought at that time probably due to also the use of, amongst other things, wax and the copaifa balsam, this etherical oil. So while starting uh, the cleaning of the surface from the yellow varnish, we studied it very carefully, uh, millimeter for millimeter, to understand the, the paint surface, uh, to understand what's original, what's uh, damaged by, by the treatments in the past. 
And here you see uh, how yellow the varnish layers actually are on top or were on top of the painting. Uh, here are small varnish tests and here you see that we have removed the varnish on this side and here is still the yellow varnish on the surface. Uh, at the very last talk today I'm going to talk a little bit more about yellow varnishes and uh, that particular period uh, in the uh, early 20th century when uh, painted uh, or toned varnishes were being applied on paintings. What we have here is, is therefore a varnish that has been regenerated sometime in the past uh, by Hopman in around 1877 uh, and new layers of varnish put on top every spring after the damp winters in the Marat's house which I mentioned earlier. Here's a detail of the hand uh, of the dead man lying in the, the painting. We know the name of the dead man, by the way. I, I do recall his name is Aris Kint. Uh, and uh, the man here, he was, a, he was a thief. He was caught several times in Amsterdam. And uh, at one point, uh, his punishment was to uh, go to jail. And then he was later sent to Utrecht, out of Amsterdam. We don't want to see him. And in Utrecht, he again continued to steal and pickpocket people. And at one point, he was sent back to Amsterdam. And, uh, and then uh, in December uh, 1631, he was hung uh, in Amsterdam. And it was a public event. He was hung. And uh, immediately afterwards, he was cut down and placed on the table of Dr. Tulp so he could carry out his anatomy lesson. You were only allowed, as a doctor at this time, to carry out anatomy lesson on people who, after a capital punishment, uh, was uh, available to, to uh, the service of uh, science. Another story is that there was a lot of body snatchers at this time as well that supplied the doctors with more bodies than what they could hang. So uh, it was a dramatic period as well. But you have a detail here of the hand, and you see how, how beautifully the hands are modeled, the bluishness, the purplishness of the fingernails down here, because the man is dead, and you see that he has been really observant to how a dead corpse looks. It's painted in an entirely different tonality, of course, than a, one of the living doctors next, next to him. Uh, what surprised us, and what you are seeing here, is that uh, the x-ray of that hand shows no hand, but a stump. Um, and we were wondering if that corpse originally may have had no hand. Um, and uh, that he really did paint after life, you could say, a dead thief that has lost his right hand. But due to the dramatic effect of having no right hand, or maybe due to other reasons, he was asked to paint in a real hand after all. We don't know this for sure, but inquiring with historians in uh, the Netherlands about whether hands were cut off thieves at this particular time, they could confirm, yes, that did happen at this particular time as well. So the possibility is there that he might have uh, shown a form of punishment, uh, and that was what Rembrandt actually painted. Here is a detail also of the face of Aris Kind, the dead body, and uh, only after removal of the paint can we see how very delicately also the lips here which are almost having the, the color of the, of the skin, but with a slight purplish hue to it, really is, is painted after seeing a dead body. It is not an invention by an artist who tries to depict death, but he must have seen a painting, uh, a picture, uh, uh, a body like this. And I also want to show this, which is something so characteristic, uh, amongst other things, for Rembrandt's work, that he's scratching in the wet paint to get more ac uh, accent uh, in the in the hairs, in this case here, where he scratches. And you can see here on the x-ray of that particular area as well that he really scratches a lot to accentuate the, the beard of this dead body. Um, and that is something that, that is, is characteristic, as I said, that Rembrandt applies paint. He scrapes in the paint. He uses his fingers. He really is uh, very innovative in the way that he works with the paint. And that's why the surface structure is so important to preserve as well. And that's why how, how we can be so uh, distressed by uh, having paintings that have been lined very harshly with hot irons because you eliminate some of this effect of the surface. Rembrandt has very, very clear notions uh, that he mentions in some of his letters and comments and 
are being re reported also in diaries that uh, the, the surface texture of the painting should sparkle. And what he means by this is that when he scratches and uh, applies paint in big huge lumps of paint that sticks out of the surface, then the natural light will also catch these areas and make an extra sparkle. So he doesn't need to paint all the sparkles to get uh, this uh, three-dimensionality in the body. It is being created by making, you could say, almost a bas relief uh, in a very low relief on the surface. That's, uh, so the natural light helps us to perceive an even more dramatic painting than what his brush can paint. <coughs> and he talks about this himself, that that is important to him. Here's just a total of uh, image of the entire painting as an X-ray, uh, a number of small X-rays uh, stuck together. And one of the uh, surprising things, apart from the stump of the man here, is that this person here has a, a big hat on in the first version of the painting. But in the version we see on the wall, there's no hat on this person. Uh, but we can see that it must have been pretty finished, and the background is painted around the hat. The background contains some degree of lead white, and that's why it stands up so clearly in, in whitish or grayish tones compared to the hat. It also tells us that the figures were painted in first, uh, and uh, then the background was kind of folded around, uh, and he was not painting from the back to the front, but from the front to the back. One person out here is hardly visible on the X-ray at all, and we found out in archival research that this person was not intended to be in the painting from the first part. Um, the other persons have all paid a certain amount of money to Dr. Tulp, who asked the Rembrandt to paint the painting. And uh, they were then in the painting, and this guy came in later. He didn't have the money in the beginning, but when he later came and brought the money, Rembrandt added him. But when the painting was finished, and in a kind of different uh, much quicker uh, manner and not as elaborate in the use of white paint as the other people. Here's a cross-section of one of the faces uh, that you see in the painting. And the reason I show you this is that down here we have a whitish or grayish layer with lumps of lead white, the white pigment that was available to the artist at this particular moment. Uh, and below down here you would have had a reddish ground layer that we do not see, it's lost in this small sample, but that would be a reddish layer, uh, red earth, and below that again you would have the canvas down here. You would have the red layer and the grey layer, and then you have a, a ochreous layer and a little bit lighter ochreous layer with lumps of red pigments, uh, which is uh, making the flesh colour of the figure. But what's most important to me in this moment is this brown you see here these small lumps of brown, looks like a little mouse running that way. And here you see another brown pocket of paint. These pockets of paint um, are the remains of, or what we can see of, the first sketch of the painting. Because Rembrandt paints directly on this gray, warm gray tone of, uh, of ground layer. And the first sketch would be what we call the dead coloring. Uh, uh, Dotferf in Dutch, dead coloring, uh, which is simply, or simply, it is setting up the scene in a brownish paint, beginning to put some of the shades in, also in brown, and then there is a very smooth transition into beginning to put in the colors. But you need to set down the, the whole composition. And alien to, or, or differently to the paintings we saw uh, in the last talk, Rembrandt do not use a pencil or chalk to paint, to sketch a scene before he starts painting. He starts directly with, with this brownish paint. We analyzed it to be a um, organic uh, uh, castle earth. But why is it standing up in these pockets, we wondered. Um, well, I'm jumping to Rubens to, to illustrate this. Here's a, a, a sketch by Rubens uh, of one of these triumphal uh, wagons. And the detail from this sketch you see here, you see these stripes here in the background. These stripes are also applied over a whitish, uh, whitish ground layer of the painting with a very wide brush, which is not covering the entire surface. And then you get this kind of transparent, stripy character 
of, of brownish gray paint that kind of breaks the harshness of the white surface so that you can paint the, the details here and easily get up in tone and leave some of it standing alone without covering it completely because it kind of creates a middle tone. That's a little bit the same way that, uh, that Rembrandt is working. And there's this painting here, which is called uh, the Indracht van het Land, or the unity of the country, uh, where Rembrandt has, has painted the whole scene in almost only these brown tonalities in the dead coloring, and only added a little bit of light here around the main figures. What's characteristic of this painting, and what's so characteristic of these small lumps of brown, which is inside the, the surface, is that they seem to have a kind of a body. They seem to, to uh, stand up without f um, kind of diluting out, like any brush stroke in, o in oil would kind of, kind of uh, ooze out and smoothen out. Uh, you <coughs> as with the Rubens, uh, these ones stand, if you feel over the painting or if you look at it in, in, in raking light, you will see that they are small ridges. They have kind of body. And how do you get a very oil-rich medium like uh, Castle of Earth? to stand up like this, because it is very oil-rich, we can see on the cross-sections. Probably only because it's not just an oil paint, but an emulsion paint. Mm. There would be an added glue or any other thing that Im would emulsify the, uh, uh, with an emulsifier to, to create a paint that would dry very quickly. Uh, turn up matches probably, but dry very click quickly so that you could continue the painting process on top of it without having this brown, which would dry normally over a long period, uh, smear into the paint. And we have made analysis on this, and we can see that yes, they are emulsion paints. There is an added, uh, added uh, <coughs> blue or uh, egg amount in this particular brown paint. And that's probably also, and that has also been analyzed in this painting to be the case. So Rembrandt is painting up in brown tones. It dries fairly quickly, and he can continue adding these other tones on top of it. So this, this was very interesting for us to to see uh, how he can build up this. Now damage is water running down over the surface, making paint flake off. Is what we see here. This was how we saw the painting. You see some of these retouchings are very whitish compared to the color next to it, some of the retouchings here in the face have gone off in color. That's, of course, the problem with uh, conservation materials as well. They may also change color over time, as does the original. So at one point, what the conservator may have applied in the 18th or early 19th century, which at that time looked perfect and well integrated with the surroundings, may not look that after a certain period because the materials changed there their composition over time and therefore to their appearance. And here is uh, after cleaning uh, the face of Dr. Tulp and his color, uh, we can see what, it, what the damages are and they correspond neatly with the x-ray of course and then uh, here you have a detail of this very blanched whitish retouching from our predecessors and the yellow varnish sitting next to it. Um, and here is the result. I believe after the recent treatment, where the again the illusionistic in painting has taken place in order to make it this, and I can assure you uh, that it's only the losses that have been retouched and not any of the original next to it. Here's what the painting looked like after uh, its uh, its varnish cleaning and re the removal of some of the retouchings from our predecessors. You have more of these areas where you can see the, the paint has been dripping down. But as you can also see, none of the vital areas of faces and hands have been lost uh, in the past, fortunately. So therefore, we could decide on making a fully integrated restoration of the painting after the removal of the varnish. These areas here, we could interpret uh, the folds of this man's uh, stomach and this, this jacket here was, was easy to interpret from the x-ray and from looking at it very closely with the microscope. One thing was, however, very interesting. Again, I go back. I told you at the beginning that we had all these figures and their names were written here so we could interpret them and understand them, just like in a school photograph again. But when we started the varnish removal, this, these names disappeared. 
and only very faint residue. As you can see, it says N I C and then T U L P. Nicholas Tulp, he's number one. Here's number two, uh, Jakob Bloch, and uh, whatever they're called, Abraham Hartmann. But these letters disappeared. And uh, we were a little bit worried what this could mean. Uh, we therefore uh, discovered that there was an anatomi anatomi anatomical drawing on that sheet of paper of an elbow and an arm that opens. And Rembrandt's Dr. Dr. Tulp is actually working on an arm, as you can see. So it would be very natural that there was, of course, a drawing here showing what he's working on, correlating with the action. And uh, you might sit there a little bit shocked about how did you just remove this? Well, we went into examining, you see one of the numbers. Examining one of the numbers, we took a cross section from one of the numbers, and that's what you see here. And in fluorescing life, in UV light, we can see that there is a fluorescing layer in between number four and the paint layer below. So the numbers and figures and the names were eventually added sometimes in the 18th century on top of an already oxidized varnish layer that would fluoresce like this. And we had uh, plenty of analysis carried out at the, at that time, Central Laboratory in Amsterdam uh, to investigate this. And it became very clear that these names were added at a later stage and was obscuring this drawing uh, to such a degree that uh, we, together with the director, art historians, and uh, a lot of other people, decided that we would like to keep this painting uh, as Rembrandt had wanted it. Here you see one of the other figures. Uh, so we accepted that the names would disappear from this drawing. We are not adding them again, and we will let the drawing add to the story the iconography of the painting. However, some of the residues of old paint that was not able to be removed easily with the uh, restoration campaign we did, we left there. So if you stand in front of the painting, you can see faint remains of some of the names, uh, probably and the earliest version. And as it had been cleaned in between, some of these letters may have, or, or names may have disappeared early on as well, and <coughs> added it once again. There were two layers of, of letters already. But uh, we decided to, to uh, leave the painting as Rembrandt's intention had been, with an anatomical drawing visible to the public. But this close-up makes a transition to another problem that we encountered with this particular painting by Rembrandt. And that, that is all these small holes you see in the surface here. All these small white spots. Rembrandt never saw these white spots. He never intended that they should be there, just as he never intended this letter, or this uh, cipher, seven, to be there. And therefore, I will read a, up a, a few texts here, just in, in principle. When a painting becomes a finished picture, it has to dry physically by evaporation of water and solvent, and chemically by reaction of air with the binding medium, which constitutes to form a non-sticky, viscous mass that keeps the pigment particles in place. This is how a scientist would describe what happens when the artist has finished his paintings, laid down the brush, and sells off the painting. It dries. There's a molecular reorganization after evaporation of various solvents and waters within the whole structure, and you have a painting. So when the painter is satisfied with the picture, a lot of processes are starting up to solidify the painted creation. These are the words by a chemist in Amsterdam called Jaap Boon, and some of you may know him. Um, well, what happened in this painting is, and you see here a detail of the added figure to the very left in the painting, uh, you see his part of his eye here, he's standing looking inside the painting this way. He's very thinly painted over the black background, and you see, or I hope you see, a lot of small spots, black spots in this case. These are small black holes that contains, in some cases, a whitish material. Um, and just visible to the naked eye, the firm, uh, the firm <coughs> protruding lumps 
and associated holes can often cause the surface of paint to appear dull, gritty, and bland. This is taken out of context, as you can see. Um, but they have an average diameter between 100 and 200 micrometers, so parts of a millimeter. Uh, and it look, they look like small craters, and uh, you can see them under a normal stereo microscope. You can also see them on the X-ray here as small black spots, because where these eruptions have taken place through the paint layer, the lead white that would normally cover this face is not present anymore to the same degree. Well, we were quite surprised that there was kind of eruptions, volcanoes coming out on a micro scale in the surface of this painting and associated with the uh, laboratories in Amsterdam and with the uh, Institute of Fundamental Research into the Matter, which is the FOM Institute in Amsterdam, we wanted to resolve what is going on here. Is it a matter of all the treatments or is it a matter of the composition of the paint layer uh, or what is it actually? Uh, what you see here at the top is part of the flesh paint of one of the figures and you see these small circular holes with some kind of whitish material in them and down here you see some of them catching the light and you see them as small kind of, of bubbles that sticks out of the painting. At one point, uh, we also considered could Rembrandt have added sand or any other material to the paint like Braque would have done it many centuries later in order to have a certain texture on the surface. And then after a number of cleanings of the surface with varnish removals and so forth, it may have been abraded so that this would kind of protrude. But uh, it appears that there was a kind of formation of lead aggregates or lead carboxylates inside the paint layer. Uh, which grows out of the painting and oozes out and protrudes into the surface of an oil painting, disrupting the image, and it may be a serious problem for old master paintings. Um, what you see down here is a cross-section of the face of this person that I showed you with the small dots in his skin. The cross-section is again uh, with the reddish ground layer here, a grayish bottom layer on which the pigments of the face uh, is applied on tops and the surface here is having the varnish on top. And then you see this strange void here which in the same cross section here over here in ultraviolet light where you see a, a increased um, uh, fluorescence at the very top of this uh, protrusion and some different uh, fluorescence here, lesser fluorescence but a high fluorescence in the grayish paint layers next to. So what we could figure out from this was that the lead white and the presence of lead in the gray paint layer apparently has produced, due to various chemical reactions, an accumulation of lead soaps, a molecular change of the, of the, of the appearance, of the, of the materials that would grow and slowly grow to a degree that it would grow out of the painting and, uh, and therefore create a hole with a loss of paint in that particular area here. And with cleanings, uh, this thing that came out would be chopped off and therefore you would have these exposed voids or holes in the painting. And here you see a kind of a cartoon-like uh, description of what is happening. You have the lead whites, you have aggregates forming, and the become bigger and bigger and grow out of the painting and pushes out and makes these crater-like forms here and by cleanings the top is being cut off, you could imagine. Uh, so it underlines uh, to some degree that uh, a plastic deformation uh, is taking place and that paintings are continued active molecular movements. It's not just a Rembrandt hanging out here, it's also a combination of materials that still, to some degree, may work and change their appearance. Uh, the expansions of the metal soap mass leads to the eruption of the mass uh, through the surface of the picture. And we have been looking into this with techniques that you heard about yesterday, I know, uh, where uh, we could see that they uh, also created a precipitation of minium or in or or around the protrusion, which means that we saw red lead uh, very often inside this protrusion 
red lead is also seen as red paint. And sometimes white lead can transform into reddish lead. Uh, without being going into too much detail, um, we also know that painters of this period uh, worked with uh, oils for their paint that already had a drying capacity. And one of the ways to make an oil, uh, linseed oil, a drying oil, would be to add red lead to it as a powder, and it would be in the bottle of the, of the uh, oil, and you would stir the bottle now and again, and uh, just like putting garlic into a bottle with oil, you would have a garlic oil. By putting red lead into a bottle of oil, you would have a lead oil, or a leaded oil, which means a better drying, a quicker drying oil. And then by filtering this without getting the red into the paint, you would mix it with pigments and you would paint with it and you would have a drying oil or better, quicker drying oil. And that might be one of the reasons for this happening as well. Other reasons could be that there has been this very uh, extensive uh, moisture and humidity, uh, um, humidity and temperatures applied to the painting, moisture from the room, moisture from the lining, uh, heat from ironing in combination with moisture. Uh, and the formula looks like this. You have to believe me. Um, I cannot decipher it either, but some can, and it is the notion of the carboxylates. And uh, this is the Marot's house for those who haven't been there. And up in this room here, that is where the treatment of this painting took place. And. Uh, when conservators, as here, one of my colleagues from the Marriott's house, works with these objects, we are very observant to all these changes as well. It's not just the changes by the artist, changes by our predecessors in conservation, but also the chemical changes of the paint layers. And uh, as with the uh, Center of Cats in Copenhagen, uh, we hope to, with colleagues in other centers, to know much more about what it is uh, that happens uh, with these paint layers over time. Uh, as I explained to you, uh, we, we looked for it uh, and we, we think that extensive conservation history of the picture, which had these 22 treatments uh, since the year 1700 only, could be one of the reasons for this. Uh, of particular interest was the patent call for regeneration method involving the use of Copaifa balsam, uh, which I mentioned before which was documented as being applied to the picture uh, in 1877, both on the front and on the back and in the wax lining material. So it was soaked in this particular balsam at that point. And it seems that many of these protrusions are stabilized, however, at a later stage, but remineralization with lead containing carbonate phases, uh, the composition of which is thought to vary depending on the chemical composition of the painting. Some paintings create this, some do not. We made an extensive survey with colleagues in the Louvre, in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum, and Kassel in uh, Germany, to hear how many times they have seen this kind of phenomena appear in paintings. And uh, it was only in some of the paintings, not in all. It had nothing to do with a particular artist, but several artists. And uh, one of the reasons we thought could be uh, poor quality of unstable lead white paints that were produced in the 17th century that could undergo this kind of process of dissolution resulting in these uh, lead soaps. Um, but again, we are not at this moment completely sure. Uh, we believe that moisture plays a major role in this, uh, leading to a high pH degree that could destabilize the lead whites within the structure. But this is what how the painting looked like after restoration. Uh, a wonderful historical or history painter's creation of a dramatic scene in a surgeon's life. But however, it's not a true picture after all. Here is a Belgian surgeon from uh, the end of the 16th century, Andreas Vasalius. We know that Tulp was very fascinated by this uh, surgeon here. And this surgeon he had a lot of body snatchers to find bodies for him so he could make a lot of an extensive surgeries on, on corpses. Uh, even people that dug up graves to supply him with fresh corpses. And uh, what he wanted to do, this particular man here from Belgium, was to understand the body in a different way than how anatomy had been taught before. 
He wanted to really look into the body and not use the manuscript as a guide to what to look for, but he wanted to check if all the manuals about what is inside the body really fitted with the reality. That was a big hero of Rembrandt, uh, of Dr. Tulp, my apologies, of Dr. Tulp. And what Dr. Tulp wanted with this painting was to create a painting of himself as the new Vesalius, the one that has, okay, the manual as a form of a huge book down here, but he opens up the body and explains what he finds and rewrites the anatomy books. And he wrote a number of anatomy books, Dr. Tull, based on what he found. Uh, one of the problems was that uh, some of the surgeons of the past in the 16th century did not necessarily describe what they found in a human body, but had dissected animals to find what they thought you would also find in a human body, and had written that in some of the books. So you would be misleading uh, yourself if you, as a surgeon, would open up and find something that was not supposed to be there. And we can see that also because opening up the arm after Aris Kind had been cut down uh, from uh, in the winter of 1631 and in early 1632, Rembrandt is painting this. Um, you can imagine that dead bodies were not kept very well. Of course, in winter they were, but you wouldn't have formal, formal line or other things to put them in and keep them. That's why most anatomy lessons took place in winter in arenas with no heating because the body would begin to stink terribly very quickly, smell awfully. So what you would do in a real anatomy lesson, that would be first to open the stomach and take out everything in here because that's what's going to smell. And next you would open up the brain, take out the brains because that's also going to smell. And then you would continue <coughs> with the extremities. So this painting is not a realistic representation of what actually happened. It is a history painter of work at work depicting something that should be interpreted by his contemporaries, not as anything else than, here we have the new Vesalius, Dr. Tulp. So it also has its iconography, like any other history painting would have it. So from having these portraits, of school portraits, uh, it evolves into this particular painting, and uh, this, I think, is where we end with a dramatic painting for hopefully a nice lunch. A few years back, a lot of museums around Western Europe were celebrating uh, Rembrandt's birthday. Uh, he was born in 1606, and in 2006 there were numerous exhibitions to celebrate this. And also at the National Gallery of Denmark, we wanted to participate in this, because at one point in history, we had ten paintings by Rembrandt hanging on the walls. This is one of them, and here is another one, and here are even more of them. All these paintings, and a couple more, uh, had been acquired by the Danish National Gallery over the years, and uh, especially in the early 20th century, uh, one of our chief curators, Karl Massen, he was uh, chasing the collections of the royal castles, uh, going into the attics and down in the storage rooms, and even in a f faint light, he could discover, here's a new Rembrandt. And he would come back to the National Gallery, hang it up on the wall and say, well, here we have another old master. So, scholars from other collections of course began to question throughout the 20th century some of these attributions to Rembrandt and um, by 1989 this painting was the only one hanging in the gallery as being by Rembrandt himself but in 1989 the Rembrandt research project uh, which was started already in the 1960s uh, came up with another verdict and declared that this painting there was not by Rembrandt either. So suddenly the National Gallery of Denmark had no Rembrandts anymore. That can happen and that's fair enough. But uh, when we were preparing for the exhibition uh, in 2006 about Rembrandt, we thought uh, we'd like to show real Rembrandts together with the 10 paintings that once had the label Rembrandt attached to it. But in order to tell the public what 
And we having then, we wanted to research these paintings to tell them uh, why they were not Rembrandt, why we had thought they were, but why they were not anymore. So the idea was to research these 10 paintings and uh, uh, an international team of experts, including the Rembrandt research people uh, from Amsterdam, who finally had declared that none of them was by Rembrandt, to join in and to research these paintings. Um, the research started by looking at the material that the paint was applied to. As we had already talked about it, the panels in some cases and the canvases in other can uh, cases. And here we have an artistic studio. Uh, it's not by Rembrandt. Um, and uh, what you see at the back here are three panels, as we talked about them before. And here you have them in close by. Uh, three panels leaning against the wall. And uh, yeah, we wanted to study uh, those panels on our paintings. And the first one to examine was a small painting by an old man. And here's the backside, nice oak panel, one piece of wood. And here's the front of the same painting. A small painting of an old man in profile. Uh, it's even signed up here with a monogram. Uh, R-H-L for Rembrandt Hamans van Rijn from Leiden. And, uh, but it was not supposed to be by Rembrandt. Uh, it had been in storage for a long time. During investigations, we could see that this signature, just like the Bosch uh, painting from, uh, from uh, Glasgow, this signature is later added. It's not a real from a signature from the time. It's added on top of a varnish layer. So it was not Rembrandt's signature, but looking into the construction of the wood, uh, and here's just one of these images that shows carpenters at work, uh, cutting down timbers of various sorts, uh, looking at tool marks. Uh, look, these guys are sawing planks out from this block of wood. Uh, and with the aid of dendrochronology again, we could see that this little plank with the face in profile of an old man was again from somewhere in the Polish region. And it has been cut down early in the uh, 17th century, about 1601 or two. Uh, and would then have been seasoned uh, and been available for anybody to paint on around uh, 1625. So by having the plank piece of wood that would fit within the notion of Rembrandt eventually having painted it was the first step in saying, well, that could fit within the argument of attributing it or reconsidering it as a painting by Rembrandt. Now this X-radiograph, X-ray image of the painting shows you uh, more than just the portrait in profile because you actually do not see that profile very clearly on this painting. Uh, you would have the eye here, you would have the nose, the chin going in here. But there's this repaint around the, the back of the head of the old man, and there's something going on here which has been painted out. The white areas do not correspond, as we just go back, to bright areas in the painting. So you would not anticipate much lead white being, being used in the back of this painting. It's entirely in the face, in the hairs and the lights. But by having this repaint around here and here would indicate that something more is going on. There must be something that was painted away, painted out. And by looking carefully at it, we believe that we can see that this eye socket here, which is comparable to the profile you see of the old man, should be seen together with this darker point here and that there is actually a kind of a face that was looking in three-quarter profile down somewhere in behind this paint layer. And then Rembrandt painted it away and made the profile on top of this. But in order to obscure the first three-quarter profile, uh, he must have applied this. And we can see that, here we have him again, that it's a little bit like what we see here. This kind of face we anticipate to, that we we kind of can see down below this one, thanks to the X-radiograph. And just like with this painting here, this one, and here we have an X-ray, you have to see it in reverse. And like this other painting here of an old man, 
these paintings are not sought to be portraits of any old person, either from far away or from close by, a rabbi or somebody from here, or just an old man. No, they are sought to be studies of heads with lights falling on them. And they have a term in, in, in uh, contemporary Dutch like a trony. A trony is not a portrait, it's not just a fantasy face, but it is using a well-known face in his surroundings for the study of how does light play on the surface of skin and hair and fabric and all this. So it's kind of a study object for Rembrandt during his formative years where he wants to understand, as the title of this exhibition is, how light and shadow meets. How does all this play around to these figures? So the core subject of this painting is understanding how light falls in between a very, not completely bold, but kind of fluffy hair on the top of the head, which this figure has when you see it, uh, if we go back with up here, the light falling on the foreground. So these kind of tronies is something Rembrandt uh, paints again and again. And what's also characteristic by m many of these are that below them are other studies because they were not painted for the market. They were simply for his own reference uh, base, you could say, uh, of, of what faces and, and uh, figures could look like. Some of them would be reused in larger compositions. Uh, some of them were simply just a play of light uh, seen on a face that could be inspiration for that other history painting he was going to paint. And as I mentioned before lunch, being a history painter would mean to invent images with imaginary figures. But to paint a face on an imaginary figure from uh, a myth mythological story would still mean to give that face expression and not just a face. So he would base these faces on studies of people that he would find around him that could serve this purpose after having studied elaborately how light falls and, and plays on and, and different uh, textures. So with this in mind, uh, the Rembrandt research people and the rest of us uh, have decided that this small painting uh, he here actually very well can be by Rembrandt itself. Uh, I would like to underline that the technical research itself cannot attribute a painting to a specific artist. It could help us understand if the materials fit with the environment of which we know an artist is working. Uh, it's still uh, art historical research, uh, research into form, presentation, brushwork, that will finally give the verdict whether it's a painting by Rembrandt or not. So the X-ray, the, the secondary image that we feel is in here, the dendrochronological dating is not sufficient to say that this is Rembrandt, but it adds to, like in a court case, it is extra material that can help and assist the art historian in drawing a non-speculative uh, verdict about the authorship of the painting. Here are two paintings. Both of them have been strongly attributed to Rembrandt. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Uh, and the one that was hanging uh, in one collection and thought to be the pristine, wonderful portrait of Rembrandt is no longer, but this one is. It has something to do with our understanding of how Rembrandt creates the brush strokes as well. And the notion of Rembrandt having worked in Leiden, being a young painter there, trained, as, as uh, uh, I mentioned to you, as a history painter, but also painting portraits, because that's some of the things that he really was, was very good at. Uh, did he paint very painstakingly delicate and, and detailed? Or was he a little bit rougher, a little bit quicker in his brushstrokes, like we see in the late oeuvre of Rembrandt, where he becomes very loose, very much inspired by Titian from Venice, for instance more indicative than descriptive in the way he paints. Uh, well, the notion has always been the young Rembrandt was detailed. As we see in Leiden, his pupils, Gerrit Dau, one of his first pupils who started when he was only 12 to train with Rembrandt, and who later formed what was called the Leiden School of Fine Painters, Fine Schilders. Uh, and he was detailed to 
the, the finest detail. The brush hairs on a broom or the hairs on a broom would be painted one by one and giving color schemes as they changed. Uh, but was Rembrandt like this? Yes, that was what was thought to be Rembrandt's characteristic in the early years. And this painting here is hanging in the Maurits house where I was working, uh, as you know, and was thought to be one of the blocks of foundation to build the knowledge about Rembrandt's oeuvre. The painting is from around 1630, uh, just when he moved to Amsterdam. Uh, I don't know if any of you notice a difference, a difference between this one and the one I showed early on when we started about Rembrandt, where I also showed his self-portrait. Uh, but that was not the same image I showed you at that time. Um, this painting is delicately painted. Uh, Hey, here's the one I showed you at the beginning, uh, at my first lecture where I mentioned Rembrandt. Uh, it's hanging in Nuremberg in Germany. And here's a horrible version hanging at the National Gallery in Denmark. I'm afraid we have the, the worst imaginable version of these three. But here are three of them. And uh, which one is now by Rembrandt? Nobody has ever questioned that this one was the real one. Well, it's not completely true. There was a German art historian, Klaus Grimm, who uh, up through the 1970s was raising questions to the authorship of this one, or rather he was saying, I think this one is by Rembrandt, and if both of them are by Rembrandt, then this one is the first version. But his articles was not really appreciated, so it was still this one. And when the Maurits House, in collaboration with the National Gallery of Art, National Gallery in London wanted to stage an exhibition about Rembrandt's self-portraits. This was chosen to be the poster for the exhibition, like you have a Hasif and Kleinberg here at your exhibition. And uh, then I made studies of these three, compared the X-radiographs of them, and you see that the X-radiographs of these three paintings are very different. This one is very showing very clearly the face. This one is very kind of the brush jumping and dancing over the surface. And this one again is looking a little bit like this, but uh, this is the one in Copenhagen. Here's the one from the Maurits house in The Hague again. And the camera here is an infrared <coughs> camera. And to our big surprise, there is an underdrawing below this face. You see the outline of the eyes and the eyelids, the eyebrows, over here, the lips very carefully drawn. You see a hairline here and wild curls in the hair, something Rembrandt never did. And when we even look closer, we can see here's a second or a third eye, and there's another one out here. And this line we see here corresponds with this one. So it's as if there has been one image down there that was moved up and then drawn and painted. Here's the painting. Uh, for our reference. But what now with the one in Nuremberg in Germany? Well, fortunately, our director, uh, when he saw this infrared image, said, we need, now we need really to find out. We take our painting in a big crate and transport it to Nuremberg, agreement with the scientists and the curators and the director in Nuremberg to study both paintings next to each other in the studio. X-rays, infrareds, all the technical stuff on the table, and after two days uh, of looking and examining uh, with infrared as well, where we don't see any underdrawing in the Nuremberg version, what we do see is kind of a funny blotchy and, and bright areas in the shadow areas, which you do not see here, uh, something that corresponds to a very thin applied paint that really does not cover the, the ground layer. Uh, where here the, the paint uh, of the shadow area of the face is very meticulously covering everything of the, of the underlayer of the, of the panel. Uh, the differences in these two, uh, conf and this one, uh, I'm sorry, I just, we have it so we wanted to show it, and here's a little bit of underdrawing in this painting as well in Copenhagen, but otherwise it looks more Habsburgan than anything else with a pronounced chin. Um, here's some of the underdrawing about one of these studs on the, on the dress, which you have also in the Maurits House painting, some more searching drawings. Uh, 
So it needs, it means that we can change the chronology and say this one from Nuremberg is the original painting, the first version, and this one is probably not at all by Rembrandt. And the difference in having two sets of eyes here, you can see it here, these eyes are lower on a lower line and would fit here. His back is more curved forward, so he is sitting in this way, looking at himself while painting his own portrait, of course. And then apparently somebody in the studio wanted to give him more erect back and, and, and yeah, paint him as he wanted Rembrandt to look, as a proud young artist just before he moved to Amsterdam. And then apparently somebody else was also there at the same time. So they are all three from the same period, all three planks from the same period, not the same tree, but this one is the only one uh, that we can attribute to Rembrandt. Um, with the this attribution of this painting in the middle, like the other one I showed you of the Rembrandt self-portrait with a Barrett, uh, that was kind of a blow to some of the art historians because those two or three paintings uh, were foundations in understanding the early Rembrandt. And this painting, which you could see on the, uh, sorry to flip around here, has an entirely different way of brush handling as you can see it in the, in the x-ray, with all these kind of splashes and uh, of paint. That is characteristic of even the early Rembrandt, who is not too refined, but very precise in how the brush lands on the canvas, but he does not need to paint out every detail. And that was made the, the big difference in understanding and therefore also reattributing some of the early Rembrandts. Sorry for flipping back again. Here we were. Now, I'm not changing totally the subject, although I'm showing you entirely different images. This is a huge image, it's about three meters tall, and showing an indigenous person in Brazil. This is Mauritz, the one who had the Mauritz house in The Hague built, uh, who was also the governor of Brazil, and it was his trade with sugar from Brazil that m enabled him to build the Mauritz house, and to employ an artist like Albert Eckhart to come to Brazil and paint the people that you would meet in the New World, to document them as a kind of uh, reportage of the New World. And when we go close to some of the faces, and here we have two from two different paintings, all attributed to and signed by Albert Eckhart, with a very clear signature at the bottom, we can see in infrared that the eyes are painted entirely differently. The black in the eyes of this person, uh, the, the white in the eyes of this person shows black on the infrared image, where the white in the eyes of this person shows white. Is this an accident? Probably not. Here we have two more, two different paints again. There are eight paintings in total in Copenhagen of these huge uh, portraits. And uh, the infrared image of the man to the left also shows the white in the eyes as black in the infrared image, and over here it remains white. This reflects a different working technique by artists. The paintings by Eckhart in Copenhagen are not all by Eckhart. Because an artist that understands that the white in the eyes is not white, it has a slight bluish tone to it because of the blood that streams through. He would add a little bit of black to the white, and thanks to the black, the white will turn slightly bluish. If you use lamp black, for instance, you would have this slightly bluish, bluish hue to it. This artist knew that this would create the effect, and thanks to the technique of the infrared imaging, which can record the use of carbon black or black pigments below the paint layer or within the paint layer, we can see that this artist knew or had his recipe of painting white in the white of eyes by adding black, and this one didn't use this particular recipe. So in that way, we can kind of differentiate uh, with this technique. And here we are sitting. This person here uh, is Ernst van der Wetering, and he has been the director of the Rembrandt Research Project for many, many years, and he just retired very recently from uh, the project in Amsterdam. And then we have colleagues at the studio in Copenhagen. We're looking at this woman, which was also at one time a Rembrandt painting in our collection. The woman with the carnation, she's called. Um, 
And here we have Hasse von Kleinberg, which we have a new exhibition in here next door. And I wanted to compare these two paintings very closely and also with the technique uh, of looking very closely indeed, first of all. The painter in Copenhagen has been very meticulous, very precise, blended brush strokes where Rembrandt's eyes are much more undelicate to some degree. It captures the wet eyes. She's having slight hay fever, I think, uh, when you look at her in here in the exhibition, uh, Reggie's nose as well. But the brush strokes are visible if you really get close to the painting. At a distance, they blend for in your eyes, like the chromatographic retouching we talked about earlier on. Um, if you look at it in infrared, uh, you will see the difference I showed with Eckhart. The white in the eyes of Hasif and Kleinberg shows up black in uh, this image here because Rembrandt also uses that same knowledge that the white in the eyes should be painted with a little bit of black to get that effect of looking like the white in the eye that it really looks like with a bluish haze to it. So the infrared imaging there can lead us into understanding different ways of painting. Another difference between the two women, uh, apart from the the way of painting is different, is also that this artist here has not understood how light falls on the portrait that has light falling in from the left because the reflection in the eyes is on the wrong side. It should be like on Hasia, on the same side as on which the light falls on the face. Mm -hmm. So small details can reveal a lot about understanding close looking like Ernst van der Wetteringen here at this point, looking at the one that was the last Rembrandt in our collection until we decided that the old man uh, in profile again was by Rembrandt. Uh, we are looking at the signature down here, and this is uh, Mrs. Karin Groen, uh, Karin Green translated. She is a conservation scientist and has been working for many, many years with the Rembrandt Research Project in studying the techniques and materials of Rembrandt. Here is our painting. It's the Last Supper. Uh, or no, it's, it's the Christ in Emmaus. Uh, I'm sorry. Christ in Emmaus is breaking the bread here, and the disciples suddenly recognize who he is. It's very relevant for Easter. Um, and here is a curtain rod painted, and a curtain hanging here, and trompe l'oeil, illusionistic indication of that this painting could be covered by this curtain if you would draw it over to the right. Uh, and here's another painting, which is hanging at the Louvre in Paris, painted on wood. It is uh, somewhat smaller, and you see the light is falling in from upper left, whereas in the Copenhagen painting, the light is coming from a light source in here behind and falling on the right, uh, on the figure of Christ. Um, when you look at the light here, there's also something problematic because this young man here is holding a plate with food on it, we assume, with one hand here around the plate and another hand with a glass, or is he holding the plate or is he holding the light? And there's an old woman, is she the one with the glass? And where's then her right arm? Well, it's behind this man, but could her right arm come in and hold a light here behind this head? It looks very difficult to imagine how that light source is being held there. Would Rembrandt make a mistake like this? Probably not. Um, an x-ray, of, uh, or a detail rather, of the painting uh, does not help us much. Uh, the only difference we can see is that this finger here is kind of raised, and it was in the painting down on the table, but it's kind of raised as if he in the first version, points to the bread to indicate what we should look for. Uh, the figure is painted uh, first, and the background painted up back behind him. Um, but otherwise, we do not learn much about whether uh, it could be Rembrandt or not. Looking at this painting from the Louvre, which nobody has ever questioned as being by Rembrandt, uh, and looking at how the light falls and how the yeah, the anatomies of the various persons looks convincing. 
and looking at the X-ray, uh, which is looking a little bit disturbed by uh, it being painted on a panel that also has a cradle, like we saw this morning, on the back, uh, which also shows, of course, on the X-ray. Uh, we can see uh, that there are minor, change, minor changes in some of the figures, minor changes in the hands of Christ, that are much more correctly depicted than you see them in the Copenhagen version. So we were confirmed in that the Copenhagen version could not be by Rembrandt, uh, by having, fortunately, this version here. But at the same time, we could see that the Copenhagen version was produced in Rembrandt's studio, not because it has Rembrandt's signature, which the Copenhagen version has, uh, a signature that is not painted by Rembrandt's hand, uh, but the ground layer, the layer below the paint layer, is of a composition that only was used in Rembrandt's studio. So this, our painting, uh, the Emmaus painting, is one of these examples I mentioned earlier of Rembrandt accepting a skilled student, apprentices, to make a variation of one of his paintings to be sold as one of his from the studio of Rembrandt. So in a way, it in the 17th century probably was a Rembrandt, but we cannot accept it with our current knowledge or our current wish to only accept the real thing and not the things that the master's hand has not touched to the same degree as we anticipate that it should have been to be a real thing. So the question is, is our Rembrandt not a Rembrandt or is it actually still? As Rembrandt could accept it, why wouldn't we? but it is Rembrandt studio uh, nowadays. Here I'm drawing another painting from our collection, an old woman. Uh, I don't know if, the, if it can be seen by you because of the light up here, but she's having kind of a black veil coming down in front of her hands, so you cannot see them clearly, but there's kind of a, uh, a, a, t a textile hanging down here. But notice that she's having the light from above it just hits her nose and a little bit of her collar and her hands. But there is some light falling also here and a little bit of light up here over her eyes. This painting here is by Rembrandt. Also shows an old woman, also sitting with the light falling from the top and just the no tip of the nose is being hit by the light and her white uh, dress in front of her and then she's having her book. But the big difference is that in the painting by Rembrandt, we can see that the light that hits the nose also hits the book and is reflected back. That also is the case here, but there is no book. A student replicating, making a new variation of what, what he sees that his master does, but do not understand completely that I cannot have a reflection in her eye sockets from something from down here if there is not a reflector. That's what makes Rembrandt, you could say, almost so modern, because he works like uh, cinema people with reflectors of light, and he knows how they would work in reality, and cast the light in various directions. Uh, and in this way, we can also sort one out from the other. So our painting is after Rembrandt, studio of. But now this strange figure, this painting was also once a Rembrandt in our collection, and sometimes in the early, uh, well, early 50s, I believe, it was taken out of, put into storage as a kind of a 19th century ambitious student making a painting in the manner of Rembrandt. And when the Rembrandt Research Project started at the National Gallery in Copenhagen, this painting has also already been restored because nobody could with their wildest fantasy, imagine that this could ever be a Rembrandt. So that they were not waiting to do, treat this painting until the commission started, because only the other ones were really relevant. Well, by explaining this to you in this way, it already gives away what, we, what might happen. Now, close scrutiny of the canvas. You can see uh, defects in the canvas, crackleurs, uh, that refers back to the way that the canvas was stretched. Uh, you have cusping along the edges. Cusping is kind of deformation within the canvas structure when you tighten it up on a frame. 
you wet it with glue before you put the ground layer on, it would shrink and create these kind of tensions along the edges that we can see when we, like you see it in here, uh, that we can see when we uh, examine the paintings. And here is an X-ray detail and you can see this scalloping or cusping of the canvas along the edges. So we can see that the format of this painting is original. It has this kind of cusping on all four sides. Now, Rembrandt was busy painting uh, this huge painting from 1640 to 1642. When Rembrandt got this commission to paint the night watch hanging in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, uh, he knew that the painting's size, which is uh, one and a half size this wall, uh, that it could not get out of the studio without being rolled. It was simply too, too big to go out of the door. And if you would prepare the canvas the way he traditionally did it, with a uh, layer of, uh, of earth colors uh, and a layer of, uh, of uh, paint with some uh, lead white and, and uh, substrate, it would probably crack while rolling it. So he wanted to invent a new type of ground layer that could stand being rolled to get out and being unrolled and put up where the painting was supposed to hang. At the same time as Rembrandt got this commission, Amsterdam had a huge boom, a lot of people moving in, a lot of houses being built, a lot of bricks being produced. And uh, this is what we find the remains of within this ground layer of the, uh, the uh, night watch. You have down here, you must imagine the, uh, the canvas, then you have a first layer uh, containing oil of, uh, of chalk with silicate in it, second layer equally so, and this is a top layer with paint, red particle and brown paint from the background of the, of the night watch. Down here you have the same cross section but with a uh, scanning electron microscopy. And you see some of these amorph plates sitting here. Uh, that's the silicate from the quartz ground as it's popularly being called a specific type of ground that contains earth pigments, but also this ground uh, bricks for brick making, that due to their larger shapes would be more flexible in a oil-based uh, ground layer. This is at least how, how it has been interpreted that this must be the case, because this is the very first painting uh, by Rembrandt that has this specific type of ground that so far has never been found in any other painting outside Rembrandt's studio. Except a number of paintings like these three, which we have just, uh, or I have just told you are not by Rembrandt, or this one is not, and this one is not, but they have that quartz ground like in the Night Watch, which confirms that they were produced in Rembrandt's studio, but by advanced students that was working in the style of. It is not so that Rembrandt forever uses the quartz ground in his panel, in his canvas paintings after the night watch, but now and again it pops up. And it's found on all these three, also on this one. And here we have an x-ray of the entire painting. It doesn't show much uh, about the, uh, the, the, the way of painting, except again, the background is painted kind of outside the big hat uh, of the person. So again, a little bit from the front to the back in the way of painting. Here's a painting as it looks. Here's another painting with the same kind of figure, or at least the same person, we believe, but in a frontal view. And here, it's a little bit more three-quarter, the way the, the light falls on the face, at least. And uh, this painting has uh, been restored since at the Getty Institute. But the painting is normally hanging at the Göteborg Art Museum in Sweden and uh, is, is depicting uh, this man with a falcon, and here behind him, down here, is an assistant, and there's part of a horse here. Um, a color sample from this Barrett and from the Barrett of this painting confirmed that the pigment and composition and the layer buildup and also the, uh, the red uh, paint could very well be from the same batch. X-rays of both paintings of the faces show this kind of rough way of applying the paint. It's a later painting by Rembrandt, but still 
it has similarities in the way we see the brush handling is being carried out. That helped uh, substantiate a possible attribution of our painting to Rembrandt because the one, uh, this one is not being doubted. Here's an infrared image, and if you look carefully at the very large and black and broad brush strokes in the, in the red beret, you can see that it's very quickly set down in the dead coloring by these blue, brownish paint layers with added black that we can see in an infrared image, very quickly positioning that face. You could say this face probably is a kind of a Polaroid of a figure. I want to capture this face in three-quarter profile, and I can use it later on. A throne, a character, I want to keep, not a portrait necessarily. But look at these black brush strokes here, and here they are again closer by, and here they are not playing part in the final image. The black brush strokes are much wider and much more vivid behind the Barrett than what you see. So we, we really look be, be below the skin of the painting, you could say, to try to see the brush handling, the way the artist really is creating this. And we find it, and here you had it again, just as a reminder of what we talked about, this paint that quickly is set down on which after its quick drying, you could continue your painting process. And we see a little bit of the same in that painting in Göteborg that combines the two. So some of the brush strokes up here and the hat, some of the brush strokes here, the uh, way of not using all the, not, not painting out all the background. It should be said that this, this, the color of this chalk quartz ground is slightly brownish, slightly middle tone. So areas in this face are not painted at all around here. It's simply the ground standing for itself, being a middle tone in the painting. Just like this unfinished painting in France, in a, in a small collection in France, uh, where you see, because it's unfinished, uh, you see all the brush strokes that normally would have been covered up by the flesh paint later on in many instances. And here's a terrible infrared image from an old-fashioned infrared camera a Hamamatsu camera, which also just yeah, underlines a little bit all the, the black brush strokes that you see uh, that are simply indications of form, all the brownish tones here around, all this in the dead coloring before you really finish up the painting. So all this evidence together has made the Rembrandt Research Project at the uh, museum agree that this, after all, also is a painting by Rembrandt, but what we would call an oil sketch not a painting that was intended to be hung in a gallery, but simply the Polaroid of a character, of a figure. Just like we have these two paintings hanging in a National Gallery in London, um, a portrait of a wealthy merchant's wife in Dordrecht, uh, and here is the smaller oil sketch, again in three-quarter profile, to capture the, the uh, characteristics of the face, which you see better, in a three-quarter profile than in profile or en face. You get much more information about how long the nose protrudes uh, and so forth in a three-quarter profile. This is not supposed to be a portrait of this woman either, but the sketch enabling Rembrandt to paint this forward uh, portrait. And uh, here's an X-ray of this woman, of the, of the sketch that could be compared in the way we see it at least. So the, the arguments are building up around having a canvas that is, has its original format, having a ground layer that is unique for Rembrandt Studio, and finally f believing to find uh, uh, material evidence as well as artistic evidence of the painting being created by Rembrandt himself. So suddenly the, the museum in Copenhagen who had 10 Rembrandts and suddenly had none in 1984, we believe we now have two. You may judge for yourself when you come to our collection, but that's how we present them. Thank you. Is this a coffee break? I believe it is a coffee break now. We are running terribly behind schedule, but I hope you will stand it. Is it true that In 10 minutes, there's another 10 minutes, should I start already on the next then?
Or should we take the coffee break now before I change subject? I still have two more to go, you know. Okay, I can continue forever. <laughs> so if you would please change the... But uh, there were, you were not allowed to have put any questions after the lecture before lunch. So if any of you would like to put questions now from the lecture before lunch and for now, you are very welcome. There is one question down here. Do we have a microphone for this lady down here, please? Verdiğiniz değerli bilgiler için çok teşekkür e, ediyorum. Ben bir sanat tarihçisiyim. E, burada e, öğrenmek istediğim bazı şeyler oldu. Şimdi siz emülsiyondan bahsettiniz. Belki bir e, teknik çeviri hatası mı bilemiyorum. Çeviri de çok iyi gidiyor. Medyum ve vernik ve lake arasındaki fark. Yani emülsiyon e, medyum olarak mı kullanıldı? Medium kullanmıyor muydu Rembrandt? Thank you very much. Uh, varnish is the layer you would apply on the surface of the painting when it's been painted. Uh, sometimes it's applied very shortly after the painting has been finished. Most times probably only later to regain some saturation in areas of a painting that may have been matte, become matte because of lack of, of a binding medium. But the binding medium, the, the word binding medium, we would use for oil, uh, emulsion, tempera, whatever, the different mediums that binds together the, the, the pigments. And in the case of the emulsion, it would be a mixture between oil and a non-oil, a water-based uh, binding medium that should be fused together, and then you have an emulsion. Uh, emulsion means that two different substrates that cannot blend are being held together as small bubbles around each other. Uh, like you would mix a vinaigrette for your salads, you would have oil and you would have vinegar, and even how much you shake it, it would separate, unless you put garlic into it. Then you can make an emulsion and it will be staying in your bottle of vinaigrette. And that is exactly what this is about. Uh, Artists and conservators are very good in the kitchen as well, as you can understand. Uh, because it is about mixing things and, and getting new, new effects out of it. And it is known that Rembrandt would sometimes make, mix an egg with his oil paint in order to create more pastos uh, and, and meringues-like pups on his paint to, to get the effect I mentioned uh, before lunch of the sparkling of the surface. And this emulsion we have found or, or water-based paints that still contains oil in paintings by Rubens, by Rembrandt, by others, uh, because they are experimenting with effects and also experimenting with speed in painting. Uh, the reason that I told that Rembrandt did not paint entire surface of the painting around the shadow areas was also a matter of speed. Why paint something that already works in a mid-tone by itself? So it's about creativity and speed of painting, mass production or larger production to gain money for the business. Cevabını aldım bu farkların. Bir ikinci sorum daha olacak maalesef. Ee, şimdi koyu ya daha doğrusu gölgeli alanlar için bu emülsiyon e, ya da işte medyum kendi özel e, şeyi hazırladı. Daha hızlı çalışmasını e, sağlıyor kahverengilerle ve burada bir saydamlık elde ediliyor. Değil mi? E, Peki ışıklı yerler için kullandığı beyaz her zaman kurşunla mı elde ediliyor? Ee, görebildiğimiz kadarıyla bunlar daha pat boyalar, daha kalın boyalar. Bu ince ve kalın boyaları e, üniform bir fonun üzerine mi sürüyor? Ayrı ayrı mı çalışıyor? Teşekkür ederim. Yes, that is also uh, something that is still being studied. But yes, he is working differently. 
the nature of paint already indicates that you have to work differently because a dark pigment, uh, a black, a brown earth pigment, would normally hold more oil than, for instance, lead white. You would need more oil to really wet it out. And uh, that would make it, its handling properties differently. If you would then add like an egg or something else to make an emulsified paint or a more pastoved paint, you then you again change the handling properties. And that, this is something Rembrandt works very, very uh, extensively with, the handling properties of the paint. Uh, so he would change it according to what, what his need would be, but again based on the nature itself of the paint. And when you see the white paints, they are mainly the pastoved paints because that creates that effect. The whites are often used in the paintings where Rembrandt paints light falling on the face of a person or on, the, on, a, on, a, on a, a glass or whatever. And to accentuate this light further, that's when he makes this pastoved piece of paint so the natural light will catch his painted light and exaggerate this even, even more. And that's how he makes this big clear obscure, you could say. To add a big blob of paint in a dark area wouldn't make much sense, really. But you see it sometimes in, in, in draperies, in textiles. But the light f hitting on it would not necessarily add to the illusion of textile. Mm -hmm. uh, but where it would, he would do it. You see it when he paints chains of silver or gold hanging around the, the neck of uh, a Burgermeister or others. He would add this also in big blobs. When you look at the paintings in the exhibition by one of his pupils um, uh, hanging on the back, what's he called now? Um, uh, some of the mythological figures as well. Um, I forgot the name now. He is working uh, later in the 17th century with a palette knife where he also can apply big blobs of paint and he can smear it out and he can with his uh, slight handle uh, change of his handle in the palette, and he can make all kinds of effects in the surface texture as well, um, and create these uh, less transparent areas, which he's not working much with. When Rembrandt paints with transparency, it's not necessarily glazes in the sense of varnish mixed with pigments. That some books about painted techniques from the uh, from the past has described. Uh, some of the books from the 50s would describe Rembrandt's and Titian's and all these works like paintings composed of oil paint and some of the glazes applied in the varnish with, with pigments and varnish mixtures. And this has been a misinterpretation mostly. Uh, mainly it would be oil rich areas where you would have colorants that would be dissolved within the oil like, uh, like uh, dye stuffs that dissolves or you would have pigments distributed very, very uh, scarcely in a paint medium where you would talk more about like scumbling, where you look through in between the pigments sitting there and see the layer below. So it's kind of a veil, like a bath curtain uh, when you do scumbling, but with a, uh, with a, a dye stuff you have a, a translucent uh, layer of toned oil paint over the top. üzerinden pardon excuse me ee, beyazın üzerinden tekrar bir e, tabaka geçiyor mu emisyon ışıklı kısmın üzerinden bir kat geçiyor mu şeffaf bir kat geçiyor mu I don't think he does that uh, but sometimes yes we have not been able to identify this uh, with, with, with precise certainty but Knowing that some of the whites contains egg, egg yolk or egg white, also indicates that it is the case. But uh, the the lack of uh, possibility of taking samples will prevent us from, from knowing it all. Uh, but we hope that with new analytical techniques, non-destructive analytical techniques, that we can get further, and collaborating with other institutes uh, may may reveal secrets here. There's still a lot to be done with the 17th century to understand it completely. There's another question at the back.
konuşmanızdan dolayı çıkarak bir soru sormak istiyorum. Bu Rembrandt'ın anatomi tablosunu anlatırken e, molekül patmalardan bahsettiniz. Ben şeyi merak ettiğim konu şu. Bu tablosunu havada çok soğuk dediniz. Hatta o binanın yapıldığı anatomi binasının halen ayakta olduğunda bahsettiniz. Rembrandt tuvalini alıp bu kadavra anında o anda mı bu çalışmalarını yapıyor? Yoksa gözlem bekleyen sonra atölyesine dönüp bu çalışmayı mı yapıyor? Bunu merak ediyorum. Ve eğer tuvalini alıp e, kadavra anında çalışma yaptıysa bu patlamalara o mekanda bulunan tıbbi kimyasal maddelerinde yol açabileceğini hiç düşündünüz mü? Teşekkür ederim. Ee, evet. Eğer Rembrandt bu çalışmasını, anatomi çalışmasını kadavra anında yaptı ise yani o mekanda mı yaptığını merak ettiğim için sordum. Eğer o mekanda yaptıysa bu patlamalara kimyasal e, yani tıp aleminin kullanmış olduğu bir takım kimyasal maddelerinde bu molekül patlamalara sebep olacağı düşünüldü mü acaba? Thank you. Um, we have no evidence as to whether Rembrandt would have been working in the anatomical theater. But Uh, regarding that the composition as such is not a true representation of what actually happened because then the corpse would have had an open stomach already and the head would already have been decapitated like we saw on the anatomy lesson of Dr. Daimann that Rembrandt also created some years later and which is much more true to, uh, to uh, realist, uh, reality. The most plausible explanation I think is that Rembrandt would have been present to this or has seen the corpse and made his preparatory drawings there and then based on the drawings he would have created the composition like the history painter he was back in his studio. There, there's no reason to believe that he painted uh, in front of the uh, in front of the ensemble or in front of the uh, the dead corpse. It would be based on drawings I'm sure. Mm -hmm.